Hi everyone, Dan Gunner from Insane Forensics. Welcome back to Tech Talk Tuesday. Today we're here to talk about multi-factor authentication and like many controls, we're here to talk about the limits of multi-factor authentication, specifically in protecting yourselves against uh, nation state or APT actors. So what we're going to look at is we're going to look at some of the limits of MFA and what some of the APT groups have been doing out there and then talk about what you can do um, to kind of use other to controls to deal with the limits of MFA. So let's hop right into it. So starting out for a quick overview, so multi-factor authentication, there's really um, a major, the major tenant of it is that multi or at least two-factor authentication requires at least two of the following things that you see here on this list. So something you know, which is generally a password, something you have a lot of times, this is an app on your phone, um, or a hardware token if you're using, uh, um, if you're using like a UV key or some of the other um, near field communication keys um, and what you are. So sometimes for two factor or multi factor auth, um, they'll use biometrics, fingerprints, retinal um, scans, other things like that. Um, most organizations have a significant trust relationship with multi factor authentication and a lot don't understand the limits of it. And so that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. This was, that was just a quick dive into MFA. So hopping straight into it. So U2F, Universal Second Factor, is one of the very popular open standards. Um, this was, you know, the multiple organizations collaborated to develop the U2F standard. Um, and this is what things like your UV key and some of the other hardware tokens use behind the scenes. Um, in this process, right, the user enters their username and password. Um, they're told, hey, plug in this device or somehow bridge if it's, um, if it's a near field communication device, get it close to wherever that reading occurs. Um, that provides in the second layer because it's you know, cryptographically secure. Um, so you aren't supposed to be able to copy those very easily. Um, and then once you provide that password and that second factor, you're then authenticated to a web server. So what's the big deal, right? Um, first of all, past security research has actually looked at attacking those keys, attacking the tokens. Um, there was some interesting research. We're not going to dive into it past mentioning it here. Um, really interesting uh, report called A Side Journey to Titan. Definitely check that out if you're looking for the key compromise approach. We're not going to talk about that today, like I said. We're going to talk about a much, much more basic um, avenue of attack here, which is session management itself with multi-factor. So, you know, we talked about kind of those first three phases, but what happens after authentication matters equally. And this is where you can kind of have that solid wall on the outside, but you know, you need other layers of protection in. Um, and a lot of organizations, this is where that trust relationship we talk about where they quickly get in trouble because they build very strong walls on the outside and the inside is squishy, right? It's the M&M &M defense as a lot will say. Um, and so, so what we're going to look at today is kind of that step after, right? The step after the um, authentication, the two-factor authentication actually works, like what happens next? Um, because that, it turns out that really matters for the trust relationship. So specifically the MITRE technique we're going to jump into is T1539, which is stealing web session cookies. Um, and it's exactly what it sounds right, like, right? An adversary is going to steal either a web application or service cookie and then reuse that cookie without needing to do that two-factor authentication to do those steps um, or needing those credentials. Interestingly out there, this is something that APT29 does. This is something some um, APT37 does, so DPRK. Um, and then it's also seen in Crimeware and some other toolkits out there have it in there. So this isn't just an academic technique. Um, there are groups and you see two kind of major groups that use this technique. So definitely this is where the importance of it comes in. But, you know, so let's hop right into it. So how do you steal cookies from a Chromium based browser? It really comes down to, or it can come down to a three-step process, which, um, you know, the process we showed here. So you start the browser in developer mode. With developer mode, you're actually able to do, um, you're actually able to access a lot of the under the hood of the browser information. So like when you go into your Chromium-based browser, 
you know, there's dev tools in there and there's that command prompt in there. And actually from the command prompt, you can get a lot of this information too. Doing developer mode gives you the ability to get that kind of web sh or that um, browser command prompt level permissions um, remotely, right? So if you have malware doing it, you would start the browser in developer mode. It's just a matter of adding one flag to the end of the launch script on it. Um, or if you're on Windows, you know, adding it to the command line there. Um, from there, you're able to make requests to actually query the available pages. And then once you have those available pages, it's just one more request to ask for, hey, give me the cookies from those pages. So if you're logged into your email account or you're logged into a web application, you really just have to do these three steps. Um, and for a lot of web applications, right, they might just have one session cookie in there that if you get that cookie, that's all you need to move it over to another computer. Um, there's a really good Spectre Ops walkthrough, so we kind of briefed over um, those three steps. If you wanna see it in depth in action, definitely check out that Spectre Ops walkthrough. The other thing to note, so why Chromium-based browsers? So a lot of browsers out there nowadays are actually Chromium-based. Um, so things like the Brave browser, which is a privacy variant, there's Chrome itself, there's a lot of other open source browsers that are based off Chrome. Um, and actually now the interesting thing is Microsoft Edge is also Chromium based. And so this technique actually works against Microsoft Edge also. So this isn't just kind of an open source browser thing. You might actually see this um, in enterprise land if your enterprises are using Edge. So interesting note to say there. Um, once you have those cookies, so this is where you can kind of maximize your enjoyment of those cookies, right? So a big part of this and the or the risk with this comes down to how the web application handles session management and handles that cookie. Um, some servers will look for things like, hey, let me look at the IP address or other traffic metadata to see you know, what this device with this cookie is sending me, where it's actually coming from, and it might say, hey, your IP's changed or you jumped from, you know, a geo IP in this part of the world to now, if I do a geo IP on there, you're in a completely different country, right? Um, and they might decide to shut that session down. Others might not, right? Because people using VPNs, if you change your uh, VPN, like NordVPN or something else, if you change to another region, um, then, you know, you would get kicked out of that session. So kind of a, a way to um, check without diving deep is things like, okay, if I hop on a new NordVPN session in another country, um, how many of my sessions actually shut down? You'll find actually not many do. Um, a lot of web servers, right, they wanna make it easy, they don't wanna don't want frustrate users. And so a lot of times that origin information on the cookie um, is going to be pretty flexible when it comes to IP address. The other factor that can limit um, how much an attacker can do with the cookie is the lifetime limit, right? So what is the time off of that cookie? It can vary. So I've seen web servers everywhere from timeouts of months to weeks to even longer than months. So, you know, depending on, you know, the cookie that you get here, the lifetime and the use of that cookie is going to depend on um, lifetime limit. Um, and that goes into expiring also. We've actually successfully used this against pretty mainstream applications. We had clients that wanted to kind of test some of the 2FA limits. Um, and so this, this isn't just something that works against smaller um, applications. It actually works against bigger web applications or bigger applications that depend on uh, two-factor auth or use cookies um, to this level. So, so what, what can we do about this? Obviously, you wanna keep using 2FA, right? So the point of this talk is not for you to leave and say, I'm not going to use two-factor authentication because it can't do anything. Like every control, two-factor authentication has its limits. Um, and two-factor authentication, honestly, is a great control to throw in there. Um, and that's why, like today, if you read a lot of reports, you'll see the big thing being thrown around is use two-factor authentications. Um, insurance companies also are doing this a lot. So when we went to renew our business insurance, um, one of the things the insurance company asked us here was, do you use two-factor authentication? So even insurance companies for you know, business policies are asking, are you using 2FA? Because it can be effective for what it does. Um, again, you have to understand the limits to it. You know, so keep using 2FA. 
Beyond that, don't assume that a session protected by 2FA isn't hijacked, right? Um, you know, unless you're doing an analytics, unless you're actually looking at how cookies or however, you know, that web application is doing session management, um, you know, you can't assume that, you know, someone hasn't hijacked a cookie, right? Um, and, you know, people have that warm blanket of, well, this web app uses 2FA. Well, that doesn't matter if the cookie's stolen and if someone's using it, um, you know, for another session on a machine you don't know about. Um, so that guy dives into the next one, determine your session tracking depth for web services. So depending on the level of introspection that your web server has, um, you might look at, hey, can I turn up session tracking or can I turn up some of those settings for um, hardening? And you'll see hardening's two bullets down, right? Like, what options do I have from a observation level to see what's going on with this session, right? Can I click on a session associated maybe with that cookie and say, okay, what are the IP addresses with that session? Um, and can I see it maybe like, right, jumping on a map to two or three active sessions at a time? That would definitely be, you know, an anomaly based alert you can put in. You can come up potentially with different anomalies to look for kind of weirdness, um, but some of it's going to depend on that depth of session tracking that you can get from the web service. Um, or depending on the protocol it's going over, you can get it from metadata, right? So if it's TLS wrapped, you're not going to see that cookie data in there. If you're intercepting TLS or SSL, then you can actually track cookies potentially in and out um, via passive web traffic. And if it's an open protocol like HTTP, then you can actually see those cookies going across. So you can be like, hey, why, why am I seeing the same cookie being presented um, from two very different um, external hosts, right? That might cause you to say, maybe someone's stealing my cookie here. Um, in addition to also considering that host log side, right? So if the host log of the web application shows you some of that session data that includes um, some of the session management um, and usage features, you might see some of the trends in there. Um, the above bullets can both be used on detection and hunting. so. You ideally want to use it in both, right? Detection, hopefully you'll see sooner than you're hunting. Um, and if you're doing threat hunts, hopefully you're doing those continuously enough and including kind of looking for um, hijacked sessions that are protected by 2FA. Um, so thanks for joining in this week. This was a quick session on, again, we don't want to knock 2FA. 2FA is a great thing. You totally should have it enabled, but just like every control, 2FA has its limits. So thanks for joining in this week and we hope to see you back next week.